Hello and welcome to today's PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacey Joyce and I will be your host. Just a reminder that throughout the presentation and the question and answer period, you can find your way to the chat function by clicking the chat button in the top left hand corner of your screen, selecting everyone in the to field and then uh, asking your question and letting us know whether you are from the East Coast or West Coast or somewhere in between and, uh, and perhaps a name if it was a particular student's question. We'll give you a shout out when we ask your question. So today's guest is Dr. Brian Dixon. He is a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Waterloo, and he is also a Canada Research Chair in Fish and Environmental Immunology. Thank you so much for joining us. I will let you take it away. Thank you, Stacy. All right, welcome everyone. So I'm going to uh, share some slides with you to talk about what I do. Uh, share screen. I'm going to make it up. Okay. So what I work on mostly is fish health and quite often on climate change. So how the change in climate affects the health of fish. Um, my Canada Research Chair is in Fish and Environmental Immunology, so I work a lot on fish immunology, but I also work on other things. So the picture there of me out on the boat is me collecting samples of coral. So I was working on coral reefs for a while as well. Um, but the nice thing about my job is I do get to go out and collect samples in the wild, or sometimes I'm, as you can see on the other side, in the lab with lots of chemicals and equipment doing uh, very complicated things on, on fish there. So I can do both things. Uh, most of what I do in the environment is to do with fish, but I can do with other organisms. So my model is usually fish, um, and there's, there's a good reason to work on them. One is that they live in water. So for many reasons, they're a good indicator of what's going on with that water. If the temperature's too high, if the temperature's too low, if there's chemicals in there, the fish will quite often reflect that in their bodies. And so you can tell what's going in the water by examining fish. And the other thing is that uh, they, they are vertebrates, they're like us. So if things are going on with them, it's possible it might be going on with human beings. They're a good indicator species. Now, one of the things about fish that uh, uh, makes them interesting to study also is they're cold-blooded. So human beings, like most mammals, are warm-blooded. We, we maintain a, a, the same body temperature whether we're outside in the cold or whether we're in the warm. The inside of our body is the same temperature. Fish are what we call cold-blooded or the scientific term would be poikilothermic, um, and their body is the temperature of the water they live in. So their inside of their body can be very hot or very cold, depending on what's going on around them. Um, and that's interesting in, in the light of climate change because temperatures are changing and they're not what the fish would have normally been used to. This is a picture from actually last December um, where it shows the globe and the areas in red and the, the darker or the brighter the red is, uh, how much hotter the, that place is than it should be. And the blue to purple is how much colder that place is than it should be normally at this time of year. And the interesting there, thing there is, if you look at Northern Canada, it's part of the Arctic, it's very, very hot. The Arctic, where our fish live in Northern Canada, is going to be a place that's impacted a lot. But what's also interesting is if you look at the coast of British Columbia, so over here, or Labrador and Newfoundland, there are places that are much colder as well. So climate change is not necessarily that it's going to be hotter all the time. You're going to experience uh, extremes of heat and cold. It's going to go up and down. And that has an effect on, on fish at both ends of the temperature range. So it, it's going to affect lots of features. Um, I work on fish health, and that's generally what we call immunity or immune systems. So basically, immune systems are mechanisms that in your body that pre prevent infection. Basically, they keep out things that don't belong to you, bacteria, viruses. As long as it's not you, this mechanism gets rid of them. So uh, this kind of uh, system is present in every animal and plant, and it can be as simple as skin. Right? Skin is something that keeps stuff out, or it can be complicated, like things like antibodies, as you can see on the screen. Antibodies are uh, proteins you produce to bind to and fight off things that get inside your body. Now, the nice thing about fish is they have pretty much the same immune system that we have. So they make antibodies and they have all of the mechanisms to make those antibodies and make them work. So that's why they're a good example of what might happen in human beings because they have the same system. That we have. Um, so trying to relate these two things, the, the, the climate change, the change in temperature of the water and, and, and the immune system, 
uh, is an interesting thing. For humans, it's not that much of a problem. Remember, we're the same temperature. Inconceivable! Sorry, sorry, same temperature. <laughs> That's what happens every time I get an email. I'm a geeky scientist. Um, um, we're the same temperature no matter what happens. Uh, for fish, however, um, their temperature changes uh, depending on the environment, and that changes their immune response. So if you look at a temperature scale, where green is where the, the temperature the, the fish would normally like to be at, Red is water that's too hot, and blue is water that's too cold. Interesting things happen with their, their, their immune system. So when the water's too hot, their immune system doesn't work correctly. Things don't uh, assemble correctly. You don't respond correctly, and so you can get sick. In the sort of Goldilocks zone, where things are just right, everything works properly, what's interesting is at the, when it's too cold, it's not that things don't work correctly, but things turn off. And that's probably because the fish are... Um, doing something kind of like a hibernation. They don't eat when they're, they're at low temperatures. They don't have much energy, so they try and save energy by turning things off. Like we turn off lights, they turn off parts of, of their body. And then the immune system is one that takes lots of energy, so it's one that they turn off quite frequently. Um, the interesting thing about fish also is, depending on the fish you're working at, they have different normal temperature ranges. So I showed you the temperatures increasing a lot in the Arctic, but I work on a fish called Arctic char that lives way up there, and some of those fish... Um, the lakes they live in only thaw for like two months a year. So they're used to temperatures about two degrees Celsius. And once you get above 10, it gets too hot for them. Whereas a rainbow trout, a type of fish we'd have in Ontario, um, two degrees is cold for them. And, uh, you know, they can live up to like 20 degrees Celsius. Once you get to 25, it's too hot. So depending on where the fish live, they're adapted or they're used to different temperature ranges. And these problems will happen at different points. Um, Diseases, bacteria, viruses, things are very clever little organisms, and they tend to know when the immune system isn't working, and they can take advantage of that. So there's lots of diseases uh, that can jump in when the immune system is not working properly, either at the high end or the low end of the temperature range. Two examples I've got for you here is the top, we've got a, an Atlantic salmon with saprolegnia. So this is a fungus <laughs> that grows on the fish when the temperature gets really cold and their immune system shuts down. A very more interesting, cool example is this fish. This is a walleye. If you eat them sometimes, they're called pickerel in restaurants. Um, this is actually tumors, so the fish gets a cancer-like thing caused by a virus that kicks in when the temperature gets too cold. Uh, but when the, the, the water warms up, the immune system kicks back in and these tumors drop off. So it's a very interesting model where they get sick at low temperatures, but it causes tumors. So, and, and these are the kind of things that I can use to, to study what's happening with the immune system. I can use diseases as a model. So why do we care about this? Well, it, it works for wild fish. Uh, Canada has a lot of wild fish. We have a lot of uh, important fisheries for sport fishery. We have a lot of important uh, fisheries for commercial fishery. Wild fish tend to not experience the same kind of problems as the other type of fish I'm gonna talk about because they're free to move and they can move to find the right, right temperature. So if they're cold where they are, they'll swim to a part of a lake or a, a stream where it's warmer. However, if they're in a small lake or if the, it's too shallow, they can not avoid those extreme temperatures. They get too hot uh, or they get too cold. Uh, too hot is uh, more of a problem because things don't work very well then and uh, they will die much more quickly if they're in too, too hot a temperature than they will if they're in cold temperature. Cold, they're used to because they're used to overwintering. So quite often there's fish that live uh, under the water, uh, in the water underneath the ice that's frozen in the lake. Um, but again, they, they tend to hibernate. So they don't eat, they don't uh, do much, they don't move around, and they don't have much energy. So they're going to shut off their immune system, and that's a time when they're vulnerable to diseases as well. Uh, so Canada has lots of fish, and it's important that we take care of our wild fish for fisheries and to, to maintain the environment. The other aspect I work on a lot is aquaculture. This, so this is a fish farm that I work in on the coast of BC where they grow Chinook salmon. Um, the issue with aquaculture is the fish aren't as free to move. They live in these nets. They can't move away from the extreme temperatures. And if you get a spike in high or low temperature, it can cause disease in the, the fish. And then that's very costly because the farmers can't sell the fish and they lose money. So it's, it's an important problem to solve for them, how to get fish that are better adapted to living at high and low temperatures and not get sick. So what do I do mostly? Well, one of the things is in the lab, I can figure out how the fish immune system works. And uh, I can do that by changing the temperature. I can keep fish at high and low temperatures. I can also 
uh, inject them with things that look like bacteria and viruses, but don't kill them. And I can see how they respond to that. And there's many measures I can use. Um, one of them can be as simple as giving them a disease and seeing if they live or die. Uh, or I can look at antibody production or some of the other proteins that are involved in the immune system. The interesting thing is I can work with fish. So here you see some small Chinook salmon that I could work with. I can work with bigger fish as well. But also sometimes because we don't want to use fish unnecessarily, we're trying to, to not be uh, too cruel to animals, we can take some of the cells out of the fish, the smallest part of your body, and grow them in a flask. And you can see some fish cells here. And I can do experiments with those cells. Inconceivable! Apologies again. I will shut that down when I'm done sharing. Um, and I can do both parts of it. I can work on little bits of fish or I can work on whole fish. What do I do in the field? Well, sometimes I'm working on the fish farm. So you can see here, the fish are kept in the net. Sometimes we have to do our experiments right there. So I'll set up a table and I'll start doing experiments here uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the side of the net. Sometimes I go to bigger fish farms. Oh, I'm sorry, did I just stop sharing? Um, sometimes I go to bigger fish farms. So below you can see I'm visiting a fish farm in Chile where they produce uh, about 14 million Atlantic salmon a year. And they take their diseases very seriously. So you basically have to clean up and dress up in a plastic suit to go see the fish. Um, I can also be out collecting fish in the wild. So this is fish that we go out and we collect in the wild uh, that we catch. And that's a much bigger Chinook salmon. And I can collect fish and get samples from them there. I'm working very hard now. One of the cool things I want to do is to be able to just take a drop of blood from those wild fish and uh, use that for my analysis without hurting the fish at all. So um, that's basically what I can do. I can be anywhere in the world, Australia, Chile, BC coast, or I can be in my lab in Waterloo. And thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> and let me shut down my email. Thank you so much. I, uh, I have been learning, looking at your slides, a lot about uh, fish and climate change, and I have been having the odd vision of the Princess Bride in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I certainly would like to get to some questions. You mentioned that uh, fish immune systems are similar to humans. Are there any main differences you could highlight? Uh, sure. So they, their immune systems are the same, but they don't use things quite the same way. So one of the, the problems that we have in agriculture is that they don't really have memory responses. So one of the ways we induce immunity in ourselves is we vaccinate ourselves. You give an injection, and then your body remembers that you, you made antibodies to those, whatever you injected in, and remembers for a long time. So if you get sick again, you will have a response. With fish, they don't tend to remember. So you can inject them, and they'll have an immune response for like six months to a year afterwards. But several years later, they will not remember they saw that. So it's harder to get uh, uh, them to respond again. So vaccination doesn't work quite as well in fish. And it's something that we, we have to figure out whether we want to boost them uh, more often. Uh, the thing is, injecting them stressful as well. So you've got to find the balance between injecting them and, 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 and dealing with their lack of memory. So that's one critical difference. Interesting. And uh, we have a question here from Ms. Falconer's class in Burlington, Ontario. They would like to know, is there anything we can do to help keep the water temperature the right temperature for the fish? All right, well, that's uh, again a climate change issue. So the problem is that we're human beings, or part of the problem is human beings are emitting chemicals that uh, uh, produce CO2 that's in the environment. That helps keep the heat like a blanket in, in, on the planet and it heats up the water and the air. If we could reduce our use of those chemicals, we could limit the amount of carbon dioxide and stop the increase in temperature. Um, so that modulating the temperature of the water is a difficult thing because it's a global scale thing and we have to all deal with it. Right. And um, a commonly asked question of, um, you know, the idea of free range farming versus the alternative and is, is aquaculture produced fish any better or worse to eat than, um, you know, the traditional fishing methods? Well, okay. So, there's a couple of issues there. One is uh, aquaculture fish is just fine for you. They, indeed, they often have less diseases than the wild fish because the wild fish are not taken care of. Aquaculture fish uh, do get vaccinated before they get put in the water, so they tend to have fewer diseases. Um, the issue with the wild fisheries is um, they're declining. So uh, they're 
have not been any increases in the amount of fish we catch from the ocean since 1993. The same number of metric tons get collected every year. In fact, it's starting to decline a little bit. So while aquaculture has its problems in that you've got intense amounts of fish in one area, uh, the wild fisheries have problems in that, that we're, we're taking the fish out of the ocean and not replacing them. Last year was the first year on record where more than 50% of the fish consumed on the planet came from aquaculture. So, and unless we can restore the fisheries, we're going to have to keep doing aquaculture. So that's the balance you have to have there. Right. And uh, another question coming in here, what did you do or what did you go to school for that, uh, that prepared you for the career you're in now? Oh, well, so I went to school for biology. So let me, let me give you a slight rundown. I don't know how old our viewers are. Our but, viewers are uh, mostly younger elementary students today. I, I think, but I'm not sure of their exact age. So I finished high school, and then I went to university for four years to get a bachelor's degree in biology. Then I did a master's degree, which took me two and a half years uh, in molecular biology, studying genes and molecules. Then I did a PhD in biology, but mostly immunology. That took me another three years. So what are we up to now? We're up to like yeah, seven and a half or eight and a half years. <laughs> Kindergarten math. Um, then actually, after finishing my PhD, I had to do something like an apprenticeship. So I spent another four and a half years working for professors doing research. So I ended up being in university or just after university level things for close to 14 years before I got this job. <laughs> so it's, it's not an easy route to go. Um, but the thing about it is I love research and I love doing science. So it was, it never felt like a job to me. So. And why fish? Um, because fish at the time were the most interesting examples of immunity. At the time we knew nothing about fish immune systems. A lot of what we figured out is things I've done. It was the edge of what we understood with immune systems. So it was sort of something very, very natural to look at. And at the time I could see that aquaculture was going to expand in Canada and we were going to need fish immunologists. So I saw an opportunity there. Excellent. Uh, another question coming from Ms. Falconer's class. Uh, do you use very much technology in your job? Yes. So I use a lot of technology and it, um, it can be very low tech things that I do. So the example I showed you where I was collecting uh, from the coral reef, I just had a net and I'm just collecting things in the bottom of the net. That was very simple. When we get to the lab, we have very complicated things. Um, one of the things is we want to know what, what, each fish is. We want to identify each fish and they're very hard to tell from markings. So one of the things we do is we inject a little almost like radio transponder into inside the fish into their, their body cavity and then what that does is it sends a signal so we can actually um, just scan the fish almost like you would scan things at the grocery <laughs> bank check out you scan the fish and it gives us a unique ID for the fish and we know exactly which fish we're dealing with what family it came from where it came from that's fun stuff. The most expensive piece of technology I have in my lab is a, a machine called a flow cytometer. So that is very cool. I showed you the cells in culture in the dish. What that does is it takes the cells, sucks them up, and then one cell at a time passes them past the laser. And by shining the laser on, I can see if there's a protein there or not, and I can tell what's going on with the cell. I just bought a brand new one of those last year for the bargain basement price of $350,000. <laughs> So it's a complicated machine. So I'm guessing that everyone is very careful when they're using the flow cytometer. Exactly. There's a lot of training that goes into that. Wonderful. Um, it's amazing how much goes into some of this technology and how much it can cost. Um, another question here. We talked a little bit about how much you like research, but what, what do you find is or are the most rewarding things about research for you? Well, so the, one of the most rewarding things uh, is finding something that no one's ever discovered before. So during my PhD, and I still remember this very clearly, it was nearly 30 years ago, I found um, a, a protein in fish that had, no one had ever found in fish before. It was only known in humans. And I found it, because I love research, on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> and I remember phoning my boss, my supervisor at home, and being all excited about finding this thing that no one had ever found before. So quite often you get to discover things that, that no one under, understands or has seen. And, and it's such an exciting feeling to be like out there on the, on the, the, the frontier. And on the, the other side of the coin, what do you find to be the most challenging about research? 
Uh, these days, it's finding money to do the research. I explained that I spent $350,000 on one machine. Um, the process for getting the money to do research is complicated. The university doesn't give me any money to do it. I have to find it myself. And quite often, I have to apply to the government uh, for them to give me money. But because it's industry based, I also have to talk to companies. So I talk to the aquaculture companies, I talk to the fish vaccine companies, and I have to coordinate all these people and get them together, come up with an idea, explain how it can help the company, write the grants. And, and you know, so I'm just starting to work on a project now, again, working on high temperature and fish uh, on the East Coast, but it took me two years to put that together. <laughs> so two years of paperwork to start doing the research. That's the challenging part. The strange ways that you earn the money that <laughs> comes into the yeah. lab. Exactly. Um, Back to some more questions about uh, about the science and climate change. Um, we've talked about how the temperature in the water being changed by climate change is affecting fish health and their immune systems. Um, humans have a slightly different immune system and our environment is different, but do you see a parallel at all in how climate change will affect people? Um, yeah, there are some parallels. So one of the things about diseases is they tend to live in places that are optimal for their temperature and their environment. And one of the things that we're going to see, I think, as climate change happens, as the average temperature where we live increases, diseases that are common in, in southern or warmer climates might move into where we live. So we might see a change in the profile of diseases that humans experience. Uh, and, you know, perhaps in Canada, we're going to need to, to think about diseases that are more tropical or more uh, from the, the jungle of the rainforest that are going to move in and be happy here in the, in the warmer climates. Very interesting. So I, I suppose that might be something that we have the ability to adapt to versus the fish um, who may not be able to change their environment. If the temperature is different, they're kind of stuck in some Absolutely. Case. And, you know, and we have technology and medicine, so we can probably deal with vaccinating people. Um, but it will cause a change in our thinking. And until we can adapt, it may cause some problems where people will get sick. Right. Um, so let me see what questions we have here. What about um, immunology in general? Um, having worked in this field for quite some time, doing lots of research, uh, what is something that has surprised you quite a bit about immunology along the way? Um, it surprised me. Hmm, what surprised me about immunology? Um, it surprised me how central it is to everything else that we do. It, it's a very important system, and it, it, we don't think about it very much. So um, we get sick all the time, or at least bacteria and viruses that can get us sick land on us all the time. And, and I would say 98% of the time, our immune system gets rid of that bacteria or virus without us ever knowing it's there. So you know the few times you do feel sick, you're headachy and you're snuffly or you're throwing up. That is very, very rare, but our immune system is so efficient that it gets rid of things most of the time without us even, even getting to that stage. So it's, it's incredible how it, we, it's there every day and we don't notice it. It's difficult to appreciate that too when you have no symptoms of anything happening. Exactly, yeah. So. Okay. Um, well, maybe another sort of general question at this point. What, um, what types of other researchers or experts do you find yourself collaborating with in the course of your research? So I work with lots of people. For the wild fish, I end up working a lot with ecologists. I actually end up working with uh, fisheries managers, people from the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, and from the American side, the, the, the fish and wildlife people. Um, I work with people from vaccine companies. I, I work a lot with aquaculture people. Um, I work with veterinarians because they're often involved in the, the fish farms. Um, I find myself working with uh, people who are experts at molecular biology and the technology because I don't always know the technology. So it's a wide range of people that I, that I work with with a, a very different points of view on what goes on. The ecologists often have a very different point of view than the, you know, the, the, the very molecular aquaculture type. Interesting. And do you have a team that you work with uh, within your own sort of research group? Um, yeah, I have teams at several levels. So I have my, my own lab. And so I have uh, two people working there who are doing those postdoctoral apprenticeships. And I have three PhD students, two master students, and about four or five undergraduate students all working for me now. And they all do various interesting things. The, 
the students always like it when I send them to BC to the fish farm because they get to travel and see things. Um, then I also have teams of other professors. So for the work in BC, uh, there's a team of four professors, myself, a professor from Windsor, one from Guelph, and one from Western. And we always work together. And, you know, as I said, it's difficult to get research grants. But as a team, we've applied together for several. And as a team, we look better as a group of applicants so we can get them. So I have teams of professors I work with, and I have teams within my own lab that I work with. And getting along with people and communicating is a very big part of being a scientist. We work a lot on that. <laughs> so. So with the last couple minutes we have here, perhaps we could touch on any um, nuggets of wisdom or advice you might have for students out there who think either this specific type of research or perhaps just science research in general is something interesting they might want to pursue. Um, my advice is uh, it's rewarding, but love what you do. The reason I do what I do is not because I get paid. I I come here because I always enjoy what I'm doing. I'm always happy to come to work every day. And if, if that's your perspective, then you will, you will have a, a happy life. It, it, it's rewarding to do something and not feel like you have to do it, but to, to make a living at it, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Fabulous advice, says one of our teachers in the chat there. So um, that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much, Dr. Dixon, for joining us and answering our questions about fish health, aquaculture, immunology, climate change. We talked about a lot of topics today and thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you. Uh, just to let you know, next week on PIR Live event, we're learning Cancer 101 for World Cancer Day. More information on this and other upcoming live event webinars can be found at pirweb.org. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you next time. Bye everybody.